Okay. Uh, we start off after lunch in this second track with a talk by Joachim Carlson from the Melody. And he's going to tell us what we can learn from our unit tests. Welcome, Joachim, with an applaud. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as the introduction said, my name is Joachim. I work as a back-end developer at Lunda Logik. And uh, we do uh, CRM systems, uh, systems where you keep track of your customers or your business in general. And I'm going to tell you a story today about a code review session we once had. And uh, how that led to refactoring sessions that told us quite a bit of about how we should write our unit tests and how we should actually design our code to be more testable and what consequences that had uh, on our code base. And we'd been doing developing the right way for, for quite a time. Uh, uh, all the stuff that Armin talked about at, uh, at his keynote this morning, we have that in our development environment. We have code review. Uh, we write tests, uh, we have a build pipeline that everything has to go through before it's uh, eventually deployed. But it started to becoming harder and harder to write those unit tests, uh, all the, uh, both the integration test and the unit test. What, what I'm going to talk mostly about today are, are the unit tests. And uh, at one point, um, At one point, uh, our unit tests started to look like this. Uh, we do a lot of patching, uh, monkey patching of code around us uh, in order to test a small piece of functionality within our code base. And uh, it's getting more and more uh, un uncomfortable for us for to, to create those tests. So I'm going to talk a bit about one function and how that led to us to, to refactor that function. Uh, but first, uh, a little bit about a bit of background to what this function does so you uh, have an easier time to keep up later on. Uh, one thing that's central in a CRM system is to keep track of what you've done. Uh, uh, for instance, if you call the customer, you want to log in activity that says who you talk to, when you talk to him or her, uh, what deal you the, the conversation was about, so you can cross-reference that later on and see what activities have I done for this deal and, and stuff like that. And one thing you want to do when you add uh, those notes in our system is to relate stuff to other, other things. If I talk to a person, you want to quickly find the deal you talked about and add that to the note, so we have an easier time cross-referring that later on. And uh, this particular function we're talking about here is the search function, the small piece of function that uh, when you want to, one, well, once you add a note to, to, to a call or a person, you want to search for relevant details. Who did I talk to? Uh, what deal did we talk about? And in this class of CRM system, uh, the company is always the central piece. So in this particular case, uh, we're looking at a company, so all the searches I'm doing is related to that company. But if I uh, was looking at the person, for instance, the person I called to, we still want to make the searches with the company as the uh, central hub of the search. So uh, the company is always the, the, the central object in this class of CRM system. Anyway, this is the function that... Uh, uh, accomplish that for us in that system at that particular time. And it's not that bad, actually. Uh, it actually fits in a slide, and I, I hope you can read uh, kind of what it says uh, from back in the room. Uh, and once you know a bit about what our system does, you can quite uh, quickly figure out what we're trying to accomplish in, in this function. So this function is called search-related. Uh, the arguments it, it takes are uh, what kind of object we're looking at right now, uh, what ID that object has, uh, and the search string. And then it uh, has a kind of funky argument called the applications, which, which is a central object in our framework that keeps 
track uh, of among, amongst other things what kind of types I have in this particular application. Uh, so let's go quickly through what this function does. So first of, first of all, it finds the company uh, that we want to use in this context. If we're looking at a company right now, we're going to use that. Otherwise, we're going to find the company related to the current object. Uh, and then we're going to perform the search, the actual search. And we're going to take the information, uh, we're going to search with that company we found as, uh, uh, as a context. And then we're going to do some filtering. Uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of types in the system that aren't interested to us uh, for this particular kind of search, and we're going to remove those uh, immediately. And then we're going to do some further filtering. Uh, so we only get types that are interesting for uh, actually being connected to an activity node or a history node in this particular in installation. Uh, I might add that in our system, uh, it's not fixed what types you have in an, in an installation. Uh, a, a company can be called something else uh, within one system. So we have a labeling system that kind of tells us what's interesting. So that's what makes this uh, a bit more complicated. And then finally, we're going to find out uh, how has the admin configured this particular installation uh, with regards to how do we want to ser see search results. So the admin has configured uh, how do I want a, a company to look in a search result? How do I, uh, how do, how do I want a person to look in a search result? Uh, so that's not too bad. Uh, but then we try to write a test for this. And now things started to get messy. Uh, so in order to test this without having to have a server running or a database up to date and a search index uh, fixed, we want to have create a unit test that's all isolated from that. And with the design of the function as it looks right now, this is kind of what we have to do. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to create a search result. Uh, then we need to go up and monkey patch the actual search uh, function and have that return that result. Uh, then we need to monkey patch the function that uh, returns information about how we want search results to be represented uh, so we don't go out and try to find databases and stuff like that. Uh, then we need to create the ever-elusive ap application object that we have everywhere in our system. And we need to create the line types, or the, the types we have in the system, and attach that to that, ap that application. Then uh, we can create a company. And then we can create a person and attach that to that company. And then finally, we can actually call the function. And then we can do some assertions on how we did that. And this is quite a bit of setup that we need to, to, to do for every test for this function. Uh, no matter how small the detail we're going to try to test in this function, we need to do all this setup. And we can clean it up a little bit by using fixtures uh, in PyTest. Uh, and this means that we took the setup we had in the earlier function and moved those out to separate pieces of function that we can then later on bring in one by one. And we're going to need that uh, later on in, in the in the session. But there's still, all that setup is still there, even if this particular test is uh, a bit nicer now. Uh, but there's still, just looking at this piece of code, there's no correlation between the name of the test uh, that we're actually searching from a person to it. what exactly are we asserting and what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish with this test. Uh, for instance, why is it's, is it important that line type is equal to none in the call to, to the search? Or why should the ID be one, two, three, four in our assertion? So this is still a good test that we're going to keep because it, it, it's, it's kind of a smoke test or an integration test that helps us say if something, we've messed up something when we, when we change the code later on. But it won't be clear from that test exactly what ex assumption we have uh, messed up. Uh, so 
like I said, we need to do all this setup right now for any tests of this function. Uh, so what came apparent to us from, from the beginning is uh, uh, obviously th that we need to start extract some of those function, those responsibilities we have within the, this function to separate functions that we can uh, test separately. But the question is, how do we do that? Uh, let's look at this first code fragment that finds what type is actually representing a company right now and returns uh, the object uh, that is the company uh, uh, when it's done. Uh, if we want to extract this to its own function, we can start we can start by doing this kind of the naive way, uh, the easiest way. We just we has just create a new function called get my company, and then we take the uh, code fragment and move that into the new function body, and then we add arguments to to the function header until this is something callable, and this makes things a little bit better. Uh, at least now we have a function that only does one thing. Uh, so we don't need as much uh, setup as we had for the earlier uh, search-related function. Uh, but there's still quite a bit of things uh, we need to consider when we write a test for this. We still have the application object, which means that we need to basically create a, a whole application for, for, for each test. Uh, and we still need to monkey patch one of these functions because that will otherwise go out and touch a database. Uh, and I think we can do better than this. Uh, so this function suffers from what I like to call the bouncing argument syndrome. And that is when you have arguments to a function that isn't used at all uh, in the internal logic of this function. They're only used to pass on to other functions uh, that's internal. And uh, let me show you what I mean by, by looking at this function. Uh, we have the application argument here. It's not used for anything actually within this function other than passing it, either passing it on to, to the get line type by label function, or it's used for this function to find where exactly the other uh, get line object function uh, uh, where where that is implemented right now. Uh, but what if we change that to something like this? Uh, let's go back to the bouncing argument. Uh, so what this bouncing argument says is if we have this situation, what we want to do is take that bouncing argument and the function we pass that on to and create a new function where the, the, or the original argument is bound to the implementation of that function. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So that would mean that we got something like this. Can I point here? Oh, cool. So, uh, We've uh, here we've uh, exchanged the, the application argument with two functions. One that's called get company type, and that replaces this call. So instead of this function having to know that in order to find out what a company type is, I need to go to this low level function and pass these arguments into it, uh, this function now says I need a function where I can go and get a company on my own terms. Uh, and likewise, uh, we're passing a get lime object uh, function instead, uh, which means that this function doesn't need to know exactly where that is implemented in the system right now. But that's fine for this function, but it does put a bit more responsibility on the caller of this function. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, and we can use uh, functools partial for this. So what functools partial does is it takes a function and bounds 
values the sum of its arguments and creates a new function that looks a bit differently. So what we're doing here, we, we take the original get line type by label and we bind the arguments, the, the two, its two arguments to these values. So we now get a new function called get company type that doesn't take any arguments at all. And uh, get line mobit, we can create that as well. Just, just send that in to, 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 this, uh, to our refactored function, but hide where that is implemented. So that was kind of uh, going ahead of ourselves to just show the, the, the principles about, uh, about what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. So getting back to our uh, original function that we want to make a bit more testable. Uh, now that, that we have an idea of how we want the function we want to extract to look like, uh, I like to sketch that out as a couple of functions to, to realize for myself how this is going to look. And then I comment those out so I don't have a lot of breaking tests while I later on start to, to test drive the new functionality. Uh, so with that in place, uh, we're now finally in a place where we can start to test drive, if you like, the new functionality. Uh, this is granted a very simple function, but just to, sh to show, show the, the flow of it, uh, we're gonna now build that functionality up again. So uh, the get my company function, uh, now we have a test for that that's pretty much isolated. We have one fixture left, uh, that's the line type. And but at least now we're using fixtures that are central to the function we're trying to test. We're not dragging in all the fixtures we can find in the system just to keep the function from crashing. We need line types because that is central to this function. It's gonna find the line type for us. Uh, so with that, we create two functions that we can pass into our function on the test. Uh, so this test says that if I'm looking at a company, this function should, should just return the same company. Uh, and as that is implemented right now, this fails. Uh, so we can start to simply build up the new functionality by just making tests pass and getting into a nice test first, test driven flow. Uh, so we can start adding new tests to this. Uh, this test actually says now I'm not looking at the company, I'm looking at the person connected to the company, which is still get the company back. So eventually uh, we have with tests started to build up this function again and starting to, to uh, uh, now we're confident that it works as before. And what usually happens as well when we start to extract this is it, it's now we find all the corner cases that goes missing when you have the mess of all the responsibilities in one function. So now that we have something we think works, we can go back to the original function and we can activate the new code. And you now we can run the original integration-like test or real integration test, do manual testing or whatever to convince ourselves that this still works as before. So when we're done with that, we can remove the original code and the original call. And now we've actually made the work a little bit better, a little bit different at least. So on to the next one. Uh, here we're gonna make a search, a context-based uh, search uh, uh, using one object as the, as the hub for it. So to show the principle again, uh, if we take the uh, original code fragment and create a, a new function in this case called search in context and naively just move uh, all the code into the body and add arguments to the new function until it's callable, we get something like this. And we immediately see that we even here we have a bouncing argument, the application argument it's not used for anything. It's, it's not used in if statements. It's, it's not used in any list comprehension or anything like that. It's just used to push to another function. And 
as well, we have uh, an argument that is of no interest to this function. We don't know why that is supposed to be none. It's, it's not uh, derived from any of the logic within this function anyway. So with that, uh, we can create uh, this version of the function instead. Now we replace the, uh, cert uh, the uh, application argument with the search function. And now we have a function that only accepts arguments that arguments that are of interest to this function. Uh, every argument that this, this new version of the search function takes is central to our search in context function. And as before, we can, from the original function and its argument, transform that into something that looks uh, like the function that we want by using partial. Uh, so here we're using partial with the original search function that's in another module and hard codes some of its arguments. Yes, so uh, yet again, with that as a sketch, uh, we can now, we've now created, uh, we ha now have an idea of how we want to use this new function. So we can yet again go into the test driven flow and start to uh, test drive this new function. And for this, we don't need any fixtures at, at all. This is a function that is really nice because it's only working with arguments uh, put into it, which makes it a whole lot easier to test. So uh, looking at the original code, we saw that if we uh, pass, uh, we, do we don't pass an ID argument to that function. It shouldn't actually call the search at all. So we wrote a test for that. And that actually passes immediately because uh, this test says that this function shouldn't do anything. But we're going to keep that anyway. Uh, so then we actually add the test uh, that makes sure that we do a proper uh, context-based search, uh, which uh, we can see by this specific context string. Uh, we actually verify that we call the original search, uh, uh, search function with that. So that forces us or drives us to, to add functionality to our new function. And then we add all the bits and pieces we saw in the original code to the new function until we're satisfied that we have the function in place again. And now we have the, uh, in one sense, we have the same functionality exactly as before, but now we have it uh, covered with tests. So yet again, when we're satisfied this works, uh, we can test it and see that uh, we've, we haven't broken anything. And now we've made the world even a bit more better. And so we can go on. Uh, the same applies with all these code fragments. Uh, looking at this, we can see there is a bouncing argument here as well. Uh, so continuing in the same way, test driving it, and verifying that we haven't broken anything, we can apply that to all these code fragments until we have something that looks like this. And this might not be something that we're used to see in our code base. This uh, it's takes a bit of getting used to, to, to understand what this does. But what what we have now is essentially an, an integrator function or an adapter function. What this does is take all the bits and pieces of our original framework and adapt that to what we want to have in our new functions that actually implement our th this piece of logic. Uh, and this, it still needs testing at this level, but it actually suffices with the original unit test we had and the original integration test, but they act more like smoke tests now to, to see that this function works because there's, there's no if statements in here anyway. Uh, there's uh, basically no other logic than putting pieces together. So an integration test suffices here. Uh, and there's not a lot of combinations of code paths we need, we need to, to, to consider here. Uh, we have all, these tests passing together with 
the, the test we have for the indi individual extracted functions uh, makes us a, a lot more comfortable with uh, what we have here. Uh, and we're actually now in a position where we're likely to write more tests because we've set up for ourselves an environment where it's as easy to write a test when you add a small piece of functionality uh, that, that there's no excuse not to do it anymore. With the original test, it got quite easy for us to uh, just, I'm going to just do this small change, so why do I need to, to do a complete test? This will never break. And that's always the things that breaks in production, right? So, even though what we focused on here was taking a piece of functionality, breaking out stuff to make it easier to test. Uh, these changes, as it happens, has also made our code easier to adapt. Um, with the original search-related function, we have all the details of the application object uh, is, is shown within that function. So if we change something to that names or where stuff is located, the search related, the, the all of the search uh, functionality will be affected by that. But now, if we do changes to the framework, it's only the integrator function or the adapter function that would be uh, affected by that. Changes to how we want to do a search for this, this particular kind of search will be affected uh, by the function that actually implement implements that piece of responsibility for doing that search. Uh, and since we originally had all, all the implementation of all the responsibilities in one function, changes to one, fun uh, one responsibilities, run one responsibilities is more likely to actually affect other responsibilities because of variable scope and stuff like that. So if we accidentally reuse uh, a variable, um, unforeseen things may happen. Uh, so that takes us to the good old design principles that, the, uh, that we've, we learned in school uh, uh, way back. Uh, and the first one uh, is the single responsibility principle or uh, once and only once or all the names that this have high cohesion as well. Uh, so this is actually pretty easy to, to understand why this is a good principle. But as a principle, it doesn't help us as much as how to accomplish it. If I only have the single responsibility princ principle and see the original search related function, it doesn't tell me much about how should I go about to make this adhere to this principle a bit more. Uh, Another principle that actually might help us a bit more is the dependency inversion principle, which says that high-level policy should not depend on low-level details. Uh, and that is what we—that is the principle we broke with our original naive extraction of uh, get my company. Uh, if we look at this uh, with a nice little diagram get my company, the higher level function in this situation, was hi hardwired to the low level function, get line pipe by label. It was also hardwired to the low level concept of the application and it knowing exactly where to find stuff on the application. And it also was hardwired to actually combining those, these two low level uh, concepts together. Uh, so the corollary to this is high-level policy should not depend on low-level details. Both should depend on abstractions. And that's kind of what we accomplished with our uh, new version of uh, Get My Company in this, this instance. Uh, so instead of uh, Get My Company being uh, hardwired to low-level de details, we now have an abstraction in some sense, and that is the get company type uh, argument that we, we created. It's abstract in this, it's an abstraction in the sense that it's 
It's the get my company function telling the world what it wants uh, my arguments to be. Uh, and this makes it possible for us to, from the outside world, either adapt what we have in the framework to something that this function was wants. Uh, it's also now possible for us to exchange these uh, functions without actually uh, affecting the internals of get company type uh, or get my company. And this pluggable uh, aspect of this is what we're using when we're testing. Uh, that's what made it easy for us to exchange that implementation to something that's used for testing. And that's where testing and adaptable design starts to, to, to join. Because if, it's, if we can replace uh, a function, functionality like this easily, uh, when we're writing tests without having to resort to monkey patching and stuff like that, chances are that uh, when the next thing we want to replace something will uh, comes along, it will be just as easy to implement that. Uh, make sense? And that kind of brings me to what I think uh, test-driven development or test-first development, what that means to me. And that, to me, it has three aspects that builds on each other. And the first one, the, the ground level of this is the obvious one. We can use unit testing and unit testing frameworks to uh, have automatic tests that actually tells us if we break anything. And that's, we need to have that first. That's the first level of defense that enable us to change code with some kind of confidence. But quite soon, uh, and uh, the testing frameworks like, like PyTest that we're starting to use right now, those testing frameworks are so good, so you can get quite far with uh, just writing tests using these frameworks without ever thinking about the internal design of the functions you're trying to test, but it only gets you so far. You, sooner or later, you need to start to think about the design aspects of this, and that's that's the other kind of feedback that, that uh, these tests give us, uh, both uh, when we're running the test, but also when we're writing the test. If it's hard to write these tests, perhaps that's a sign that our code isn't as adaptable as we want to. And then the last and kind of the least interesting part of test driven development is the productivity aspect of it. Uh, that's when you write your tests first and having that as a tool for you to focus on a small piece of functionality uh, without having to consider uh, the whole problem at once. But that part doesn't really make sense if we don't have the design aspect first. If we if you only like, I don't know if, if I've been sold TDD that way or if I perceived it like that, but I perceived it like you should write your tests first. That's the most important thing. And I think that's what, what, was we, what we tried to do. We, we wrote the tests first and we used monkey patching and stuff like that. And eventually it started to, to break down and we kind of didn't see uh, how does this help us. But if you have the design aspect first, you can use that. Uh, but then it's more of a personal tool. Uh, uh, I like to get into that flow where, where I, the test tells me the one thing I should do, nex do next. Uh, but some of you don't, and that's pers perfectly fine. The, I think the test-driven approach, uh, the driven part of TDD is having the design uh, drive that your tests drive your design more than you writing your tests first. Uh, so to me, uh, test-driven design is about being able to adapt our design. Uh, test-driven development is about being able to adapt our design because it makes dependencies explicit. It's, it's I think most of the time it's the dependencies that messes things up. It's, it's, the, it's the dependencies that forces you to do monkey patching and stuff like that. Uh, 
and we have, have the added benefit of having feedback when we break stuff. So the assumption, if a testable design is adaptable, then uh, if we buy that assumption, uh, if it's hard to test, then we might consider changing our design. So, like I said, with, with tools like PyTest or a Nose Test 2, I think it's, I haven't looked at it if as much, and all the, the unit test modules that you get with Python, you can do a lot of powerful te things with your unit tests, but they're, they're a double-edged sword uh, because they kind of, prev it, it uh, takes a bit longer for you to realize that there's something wrong with my design than uh, you probably should. So there is an aspect of we having to invest something like this to this. Uh, the way I perceived TDD from the be beginning was that I should write tests and there really wasn't much of an investment. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the contrary, if doing TDD we shouldn't have to design up front and stuff like that. I, don't I just don't think that's true. So there is an investment aspect to it. But if we value code that we want to maintain over a longer period of time, uh, we I think we should do that. Like this quote says from a from very good book about testing and design, uh, then that investment uh, makes sense. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening. So then we have some time over for questions. Uh, during the questions, please raise your hand and you get the mic so the questions are recorded along with the answers. Anyone? Uh, th thanks for the talk. Uh, actually, we had some kind of problem with the Mokin and Monkey Pachin yeah. uh, from the beginning. Uh, but my question is slightly different. Have you heard about hypothesis? Yes. Do you use it? No, we don't use that. Why? It, it sounds interesting. Uh, but I don't think the code base we have right now, uh, it's, it's more what you saw here. It's actually what we're doing is we have data here. We want to munch it through. Uh, it's more like integrating pieces of code in a workflow. So it's, it's I don't know how to apply that uh, just yet. Uh, but uh, it sounds like an interesting idea. Okay, thank you. More questions? No more questions? I bet there's a lot of questions. Come on. Now. <laughs> Okay, you're sitting empty <laughs> or silent looking down the floor. So I guess yeah. there are no more questions then. Um, thank you, Joachim. <laughs> and give Joachim a big applaud. <laughs>